So before we start the portion of the, um, the rest of the RDF slide and RDFs, um, I want to make a few comments on the homework. Right? So um, some of you come to uh, me with uh, questions about the how to translate some of the sentences into RDF reports. One common pattern that I observe is on the question 1B. So in that we need to translate like the uh, roadstead is located at like at address 3640 Colorbed Highway Gating. I think the zip code is called that zip code is called Cable. We made that mistake. Um, all of you put the address, the phone address is a screen. Right? This is not uh, you can do that actually, but the semantics of that is unclear. You don't define the semantics of that. So when we have 3640, that means the number, and then the the street, the city, state, and then the like zip code, right? If you just put everything into one, like double code is a string. If somebody has a question, like um, in which state is right state located at? So in that case, that like, you cannot answer that question using your triples. So uh, let me add a comment here. Uh, Vin, what Vin says is very important, and I think you also need to uh, tie to uh, what we have discussed before. Remember um, in the previous class, you remember that um, a pyramid that I had shown? We had, a syn we had syntax, structure, semantics, and going from data, information, knowledge. Well, this is what that fundamental thing is about. If you uh, treat this whole thing as a string, it's just a syntax. Then, uh, you know, as uh, Vin is saying, you have a number, you have a street, you have city, these are all very meaningful things. Okay? If I don't, um, only other thing I can do, if you don't do that, is that I have to pass the string again and try to find the things. That means you lost the whole semantics, you did not give the whole semantics. As if you bring semantics in your thinking, then what are you going to do? As you put information into or data into the system, you are going to start thinking the semantics right at that point. Not at the end where for somebody else to find out. Uh, here is a very important thing. Uh, let me make one other point. So, if you look at this, for a human, a human is going to be able to get semantics anyway, right? Because you have a knowledge of what an address looks like. You are applying that knowledge and you are converting this string, a syntax, into something meaningful to you. Because you have a concept of address in your brain. If you are going to use semantic technology, that means you start thinking about that from the beginning because you want machine to be able to understand the data and hence have some meaning about that. That means the meaning here is associated with the concept of address the, and so all the parts of address have to be recognized and have to be uh, spelled out, have to be explicitly you know, put, put into the system. If you do that, if you help that, uh, if you help system understand convert this syntax, uh, rather than treat this as syntax, treat it as structure and semantic components of the structure. Then what happens is the system is going to be able to help you build other programs much more easier. Then you can ask the system, what uh, here is the address, give me the nearby address. Right? You, you, when, you, when you look for, um, uh, when you want to do that nearby address, if you Take this as a string, there is no way you are going to find the nearby address. You are going to have to look at the component, incorporate things, you know, a distance between the objects. Right? So you have to be able to map that. Google map is not mapping a string. Google map is ad, uh, mapping an address. Google map can show you the road because it has address, because it has the whole database of all the road network and because it has the algorithm of you know saying what is the shortest or best or whatever those things are possible because of uh, the thing being treated as address because that means the system has a semantics of that data otherwise you don't have so uh, the important thing here is that that lecture was not just a lecture for itself 
you you know what uh, we gave you was actually an application of what I had discussed earlier, and you guys need to make that connection, right?
Um, this example is uh, from one of our projects, a uh, material science project, we have prayer. Um, he is the, he's having that project, right? <laughs> He's leading that project here. Oh uh, yeah, he's leading that project too. Funding and leading. Mm -hmm. Funding is not allowed. Okay, just leading it. Anyway. And um, the third principle is, um, that means like when somebody look up the address or the identifier of one entity or resource, that URI must resolve the sum of the results. For example, like the information about that page. The last one is um, that page, the content of the uh, resource, that resource page, it must provide a link to other resources. So that will make the link data, right? If it doesn't include the links, then it's not, it's something else. Let's take one example. Um, this, so in this project, right, material science project, we created a vocabulary for this. So this A basis uh lab vocabulary slash vocabulary page as pieces. So this is one concept or one term in the vocabulary. And when you put this when you put this um, URI into the web page, web browser, you will get the result. You may want to try it here or later. So in this, this is a URI and it Indeed, it's HTTP URI because it starts with the HTTP protocol. And it, is, it can be different, the reference. That means that when you type the link, it shows you the content. The content of this uh, page, for this ABCs concept, um, we have a set of uh, triples. For this, for example, like uh, alternative definition, the comment, or definition, or label, preferable, right, source, type. So these are the information about that source. When you browse to this um, resource, you will get this information. And the, the last principle of um, <coughs> the link data principle is the, the links to other URIs. So within this page, the content of this reflect the four principles of the link data. Right? If you follow this uh, four principle, and the tool that we are using is called public, that will help us to um, create or resolve the URI for every uh, resource that we have in the data set. So that is the uh, link data. If you if you create any uh, data set out of this course and if you want to publish into this form, um, you can come and I can help you with this. I can show you how to do it. Some of the uh, readings, if you want to look into, like deep into this um, idea, is the recommendations from the W3C. This is uh, <coughs> 2014, is the earliest. Is the it's the latest version that we have so far. It was released like a few months back. And we have the ADIA framework. This is the one that is uh, easiest to read. And and more more you can read more at the um, concept and abstract syntax and semantics and still I will I will give the um the next talk is about the ADIA skill. So 10 years ago, the, the first version of RDF, you can find out in this um, document. Um, to begin with, I think these are the set of documents that you may want to read because uh, the later version, they add a lot of technical details. Right? But in order to understand the basic of the RDF, you, you can read this document. It's a little bit easier. That is for the RDF. How come I haven't learned to use the data I'm sorry? How come I haven't used the data I haven't used now to convert data to other? Oh, okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
a book. I have a book. I want to move a bit to our dear. Oh, good questions. If you have, you mean like a textbook, like a PDF, and PDF, you want to convert okay. them in an idea? Yes. Uh, sorry to say that there is no way it's an idea. Because like if you want to convert them into an idea syntactically, we can do that using the tool. But if you want to um, annotate the content of the book, right, that means you need to use some NLP methods to parse the content and you um, extract the entities and annotate the entities with their type. And you need to disambiguate the meaning of those entities. What does it mean? Right? For human, you know it, but for the machine to understand the context, to infer which, what kind of entity it refers to is a, is a difficult task. So when we say convert the data from one other model into uh, one structure, that a model into idea, we use their various tool. If if you have a relational database, you can use a D2RQ. If you have like Excel file, and then you can use um, XML to idea. Or if you have like any file, the I think the conversion is simple. Important is the mapping from this uh, from the schema of your data model to the schema of idea, like the if it is a relational database, it should be like uh, which column into which person. So it depends on your dataset. But all of them, when you identify the mapping, the only thing you need to do is you need to write a simple Java program or any in any language, and then transform the text from it is just the syntax, right? Transform the syntax of uh, the file into a. So I would say like. I prefer to use uh, Java or C or like any language that we are familiar with. So, it's very costly now to convert the current data to RDS. Even, I mean, it is very costly to convert the current data to RDS. Mm, no, not really costly. Like, we don't have a structure of data. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. If you have the data is in the structure form, like a relational database, to RDS is very simple. There is a uh, tool available. So in the last class, we call the So in the previous class, we covered the RDF part, right? I didn't put the um, the uh, semantic web layer cake here, but the next the next um, the next part is the RDFs or RDF schema. And in the maybe in the next class, I will present about the scope. So in this um, in this class, we will cover four uh, topics, four questions actually, and the first one is um, why do we need the RDF schema? Like we already express certain kind of information in the RDF, right? So now why do we need the schema? Is there any kind of knowledge that we cannot express using the RDF? Probably, probably that is the case. The second topic is all about the classes. Questions like uh, how do we define the class or how do we create the class hierarchy or how do we apply the rule into the hierarchy to inform the new knowledge. So that is the uh, second topic. The third topic is similar to the classes, but it is all about the property. 
like how to declare the property, how to define the uh, property hierarchy, and how to apply the rule on the property hierarchy. The last one is on the type separation. Like um, the questions, like we have the classes and we have the instances, and how how do we know when to use the classes, when to use the instance to represent a resource? So these are the four main topics that we will cover today. So uh, why? It start with uh, why IDF schema, right? So in the previous class, we represent like some simple sentences or a little bit more complex sentences in IDF. One example of that is Dr. Chef, which is the Web3 Reno course. So in that, um, this is the this is the typo that we. Actually, in the previous one, I used the reverse one. I say that the web three printer is uh, top by Dr. Shen. But in this one, I just uh, create the reverse property. So the motivation of the IDFS or IDF schema is there's certain kind of, in, of knowledge that cannot be expressed in the idea. That is, if we say all the professors teach classes or courses, right? Or if somebody is a professor, that person is also a faculty. Similar kind of uh, statement like uh, if somebody is a graduate student, that person is a student. Such, such sentences are for like more generic knowledge. And uh, for the term, they, they call it uh, terminolo terminological knowledge or schema knowledge. So we use, in order to support the expression of those knowledge in area, we use the area schema. So, what is the idea schema? Idea schema is a, is a predefined vocabulary with a set of terms and relationships that are built to define the properties and classes. So, Using the IDF schema, you can you can create uh, like lightweight ontologies. So that ontology, we have like you can declare a set of classes, and you can also uh, organize the classes into the hierarchy. Similar to the classes, we have the uh, relations of property, and then the property hierarchy. So what is the hierarchy and why do we need the hierarchy in the schema? <coughs> what is the benefit of that? So so far in the scope of this class I will explain like two I will, and I will give the example of two benefits of the IDF schema. One is for the inferencing from the existing uh, set of repos, we can using the IDF schema, certain construct of IDF schema you will be able to infer a new triple from the existing triple. The second benefit of that is we can validate the correctness of a set of triples or knowledge base. Um, I will give a many example within the, uh, sorry, the next slide. So, this is the uh, sample ontologies that I created for for the home uh, class. So in this, I created a set of uh, triples with with a schema a schema triples and then instance triples. And so this is a set of triples basically. And um, in the next slide, I will explain how do we come up with these triples. So let's move to the, the second part of the lecture about the classes. So what what are the classes? Collections of like objects. Yeah. So we say a class is a, just simply a class is a set of things or resources or entities anything that you name it, right? For example, we have like a professor, if you can name at least 
what evidence of Kafka does that you name it as you can call it as a class. So professor is a class, course is a class. So because we have web three O, or no, it's a course, right? So we can say course is a class, and faculty is also a class. Similarly, like grad student or you know, student or chair or room or like anything, if you give it a name and then list it in the set, that will be a class. So let's say if you identify a class and you want to <coughs> define it as a class in the RDF. So this is how you can do it. So in the RDFS, there is a building class, RDFS class. So that is the top most class in the RDFS. That means RDFS is a is a class. So that means RDFS class is also a set of things, right? So in the case of RDFS class, the set of things are the set of classes defined. And all the classes are defined by using the RDF type RDFS class. That is how you declare a class. And here we, we define the three uh, classes, professor, course, and uh, faculty. So when we say class is a set of things, and then what do we call that individual thing? Yeah. We call it class instances. So what class is this? So member of a class is called class instance, right? So for in our example, we say that a professor is a class because it contains like uh, double check is what is the of that. So this is this is how we this is how we declare one instance of a class. We say this and the is one instance of professor. And you have three we know is added type course. So in that back to the homework one, right? So in that I say the like, uh, Rice Lab University is a university. So in that case, you can say university is a class. And Rice Lab University is one instance of that class class, right? That was for, for the homework one. And Let's say in your knowledge base, you create um, a set of classes. And some classes, they may have some kind of relationship. One may subsume the other one. Right? For example, if we have the, uh, the set of uh, graduate student and the set of student. Right? Because every grad student is a student. So the set of grad students will be the subset of the set of students, right? So in that case, we say that grad student class is a subclass of student. So that is how we form the hierarchy. So in the the class, in the the upper class, in the hierarchy, we subsume the class, the lower class, or super class subsume the subclass. So that by using the subclass of relationship, we form the class hierarchy. Oops, sorry, I don't know what is happening. So this is by using the classes that we define, we can organize them into the hierarchy. For example, because every professor is a faculty, right? But there are some faculty may not be a professor, and maybe, I don't know, who will be the baby? Yeah, maybe. So we have the um, professor is a subclass of faculty. This is the area proposed. This is the idea proposed, and this is uh, this is not supposed to be shown. I was asking you. I was about to ask, and then it show up. So I don't know. <laughs> so 
didn't happen. I just rehearsed it like uh, half an hour ago. Everything was fine. So, so now we have. Let's say we have the uh, again now. So, let's say we have the hierarchy. What can we do with that? And we, we don't just make it more fun, right? So. Here we, I will, be, I will demonstrate some of the inference rule through the example. So the list that I'm giving here is not a complete one. You may want to look at the IDF schema, IDF schema specification or recommendation from W3C. So in this, uh, in this example, we have a professor is a subclass of faculty and faculty is a subclass of employee. So here we have the set of professor is a subset of uh ah. use it close at once and uh, open it up. Okay. Maybe. Or is the battery on the remote? I don't know whether it's working off the keyboard and zoom. Or... This is not good because a lot of them, like I was, there are those that are questions. I'm not supposed to show the answer. Okay. So let's say this is the first uh, inversing. So let's say we have uh, the set of uh, professor is a subset of uh, the set of faculty, and the set of faculty is a subset of uh, employee. So naturally, one can reason and conclude that the set of professor is a subset of the set of employee, right? So that is how we human perform the reasoning, but the machine doesn't know that. So if you just put a trick box like that, like uh, it would not know how to infer such a such a result. So that is why we have the we have the rule saying that um, subclass if A is a subclass of B, B is a subclass of C, and then A is a subclass of C. So that is the rule. And this is the uh, professor is a subclass of employee. So this is the uh, the triple saying that uh, professor is a subclass of employee. It doesn't like me today. So the second, um, the second rule is on is also on the IDF subclass of. So from the example that we have, like if we have the set of professor is a subclass of uh, tenure faculty, right? And tenure faculty is also a subset of uh, professor. So what does it mean? 
They must be identical sets, right? Yes. Right. They are equivalent. They must contain the same set of uh, resources. So that is the... So, in that case, we can say that um, the uh, set of professor is a subclass of professor according to the previous group, right? In that case, we say that the RDNS subclass of is uh, reflexive. That means it can be the subclass of itself. So the third inferencing rule is based on the class hierarchy that we say the instances of one class is also instance of its superclass. So this is the example. Then we have a uh, Docker sheet is a type of professor, right? And then professor is a subclass of general faculty. So what can we infer from this too? So Docker sheet is a subclass of general faculty? Instance. Oh, instance. Why is it like that? Why it is not a subclass of faculty? Yes, that is based on definition, but like, uh, how do we derive that conclusion? Because, um, because, it's, is, yeah. because it's a type, right? So the reason is, like, Anderson is one instance, it is not a set, right? Because it is one instance, and we say one instance are in type professor, that means this instance is a member of a set, right? And this set of professors is a subset of a general faculty. So that means this instance, I mean, is a member of the set of general faculty, right? Because of that, I and mean, is a type general faculty. That is the area of triples that represents the membership of Anishet in the class of uh, general faculty. So any questions? No? Easy, right? So that is all about the classes and class hierarchy and then like uh, the three influencing rule that we had. <coughs> so do you have any questions on this last part? Um, we, I, in the examples, mm -hmm. we mix the data, the data definitions with the data. How, how do we, in real life, how do we deal with the fact that we, the schema is evolving as, the, as we're reading through our data set? Um, I, I didn't get the question, so, so when, we're, when we're, we start reading our tables, mm -hmm. right, and we say this object is, a t is of this type, but we haven't defined that type yet, and then later we define that type, and then even later we add attributes to that type, how do we deal with, when we're writing our program to read all of that data, how do we deal with the fact that the schema of the objects is changing as we're reading through the data set? So we only have a final schema when we've finished reading all of the input. Yeah, good point. So compared to, let's say, move back to the what we had before semantic web, right? We have the relation and arrays. So in order to insert any queries into the table, right, you need to have the structure or the schema of that table. Like this is the name of the table and these are the columns or attribute. You need to have them all in order to insert a rows into the table. In the case of semantic web, it is called schemaless. That means you don't need to define the schema before you can insert the people. Indeed, let's say if you say if you if you just um, if you just create people saying that Amazon is like a top professor, right? Immediately the, the reasoner when it parses the triple, it will say the professor is a class. Because it, it is the object of the area type. I will explain it later with the uh, property hierarchy, but that is how it works. So basically, you don't need to define the, the type beforehand. What if I never define the type? If you don't need... 
Right? What mean, if I never say professor is of type class? That is fine. That is fine because the listener, it is smart enough. I think it is Should it be. is pro provided the mechanism to realize that professor is a class. Okay. You don't need to you don't need to say that professor is a class. Because that one will be produced by the reasoner. When it see that people, it say professor is a class, IMS class. And so do we have tools that take incomplete sets and create complete rule sets that we will never get a complete rule set here. We will never get that. So the the, the area of data set is called like incomplete data set because it is it, it represents the knowledge from the open world. And the knowledge from the open world is never complete. Right? You can always add new knowledge into that one. But but I will go back to your question you said later on. Like I have a uh, few slides. Um, so, if, do we have any more questions on this? No? Okay. So, the next part is on about the properties. So, in the RDF, we know what are the properties, right? We have subject, predicate, and object. So, the predicate is actually like, uh, it's a synonym for either like predicate or property. In this case, we use the properties because we have a class of properties. So in the IDF, we define a properties by saying that it is an instance of the class IDF property like this. Or we have like digits is a property and is digit of is also another property. And we declare them as a property by using the two triples like this. Digits are a type IDF property. And similar to the IDFS class, right? The IDFS class is the topmost class that its elements is a class. That means that all the class in your data set will be um, a member will be a member of the RDFS class. Similarly, the area properties is the topmost class that include all the properties in your data set. Either you declare either you declare the property or not, this one will be created by the reasoner. When you put any, uh, when you create a duple like ABC, right, B will be the property, instance of the property. Similar to the class hierarchy, the properties can also be organized into hierarchy. For example, digits is a sub property of uh, is digit of. Actually, they are equivalent, right? Because like, the, the meaning of them are similar. So in that case, we can say that uh, digits is some property of each digit of, and each digit of is also some property of digits. Because of that, we can also say that area has some property of property, it is tentative and reflexive. Reflexive because of that example. Um, because let's say um, from the two examples there, we can infer that digits is um, some property of digits. So that means it's a uh, reflexive, right? Some property of itself. And this is the example that show you uh, that the uh, idea of some property of is a uh, transitive. So in this case, so what would be the? Oh, sorry. So what is the, the, the outcome of this? What is the inform triples from this to say? So it would be on a chat is teacher of what three Right? Oh uh, yes, that is right. So do you do you know why it infer the, the two triples infer the latest triple? You know why, right? So that means it is not only applicable for the two triple. If you given like any triples, right? If you say like uh, like uh, some property is a sub property, like uh, property one is a sub property of 
of property two, right? And then you use the property one to say a sub property a property one b. So those two for another triple say a of property two and b. So that is the that is the rule for this. The, the for all of the uh, rule specification, you can find it the IDF schema or the IDF semantics. If we have time to go through the IDF semantics, I will present it. Otherwise, you can look into that. So we have uh, we have uh, many we have seen many rules that allows us to infer uh, a new triple from the existing triples, right? So. In the beginning, I said there are two benefits of the uh, IDS schema. One is the um, inferencing that you can infer new triples from the existing one. So, what is the second one? Okay, I can. So, the second one is we can validate the existing knowledge to see if they are correct or not, or is there any consistency inconsistency in your knowledge base. So for example, I have this set of triples and I want to validate if they are correct or not. I mean they're not human. I mean like machine like automatically write a program or a reasoner to find out if they are correct or not. So do you think that they are correct? And why? Because I know what Web 3.0 is. <laughs> Web, Web 3.0 is a course, and courses don't teach people. Exactly, right? That is like how we how we interpret the people. You say, what? A course? Web 3.0 is a course, and a course teach a professor? It, it may happen in another world, but not in our earth, right? So in that case, so... We know that there is a problem in the semantics of this, right? We know that a course cannot teach a professor. But for a machine, in order to, for a machine to interpret that and conclude the same thing that we had, how do we help the machine? How do we give the instruction to, ma to the machine so that it can do the job for us? That means, how to validate the correctness of a knowledge base. So you can can you think of like what kind of help that you can give to the reasoner? Define what? Course. Define course? In order to say that it is not he doesn't teach us, but it rather is taught me. So what are the triples that you would put here? For example like Course is something is of type uh, it's a subject or something like that. So and again you give another thing, same for subject. Oh okay, so you mean like um I give all the semantics for course. Okay. So are you saying that you will put you will create a set of uh, values that are allowed to be the subject of this uh, digits property? Because uh, if you say, if you create a set of allowable values for a course, right? That means you release all the process. Okay, I will give you a hint. So let's say, uh, if you can put the constants on one of them, and then like you put the const, like you got to the right one that you we need to specify the allowable values for subject and the object. But professor teaches course. Professor teaches course. Oh, you remember the the uh, the uh, example that we had in the motivation, right? We say that all the professor that causes. But in this case, it does the opposite. It says the causes, one instance of the causes, that one instance of the professor, which is completely meaningless. 
So in order, so that is the way that you um, validate the correctness of or uh, checking the um, inconsistency in the knowledge base. That you put a set of uh, values that are allowed for the subject of any um, triples that his digits on is a property. Right? So let's say if you create any properties, any uh, triples using the digits is a property. And the subject of that must be from one specific set. And the object of that must be from one specific set. Right? So that is called uh, domain and range. So by that, we put the constraints on the property. So the purpose of the uh, property restriction is to allow certain type of resources to be the either subject or object of, uh, for a certain property. And for example, in our example, right, we say that digits is a property. And we say the domain of the digits is, it must be one instance of the professor. So, digits, domain, professor, and the range of that is digits, range, course. So, what does it mean? So, this is the triple that allows the reasoner to go and find the set of allowable value for the subject and the object. Domain is for the subject and range is for the object. That means, the sub, so given like any triples with digits as a property of predicate, the subject of that digits property, it must be one instance of the class professor. And the object of the digits property must be instance of the class class. So by that, the, the error that we had before would never happen. Or it does, if somebody created that by mistake, the reasoner will be able to pick it up as a error. Can we only define one domain and range per relation? Yeah, you can't do that. So like, this is the, the original example that we have, right? How do we validate this set of triples? This is how the reasoner would do. It will use the restriction on the address domain, right? So here we have the digits, domain professor, and web 3.0 digits and the shit. So from the two set, the two triples, what can we infer from this? What can we infer from these two triples? We say that uh, when we use the domain, right? We say that. We say that uh, the subject of this digits property must be instances of the professor, right? However, this is what we have. This is what we infer. However, given that in our knowledge base, we have a people saying that the web 3.0 is not a professor, it is a cause. So because of that, we can find that there's a inconsistency or this triple conflict with this triple. That is why this knowledge base is invalid. And that is the error. So this is how we can validate the triple using the IDMS domain, right? Similarly, we can also do that with um, IDMS range. So this is how we do it. Similarly, we have the just IDMS range, course, and then web 3.0, the just addition. So what can we, what are the, what is the triple can be inferred? Yes, <laughs> Abishet is a cause, right? Because we say that, we say that the, if, if cos is the range of digits, and then the object of any triples with the digits property, that means this one, addition, it must be one instance of the range. That means this, it must be type cos. This is the 
this is conflict with one that we have, right? Actually, it's a professor. So because of that, this is invalid. So this is how the uh, the reasoner would work. And given that, so because we know that it is wrong, right? So what is the right one? We say that if the web three mirror pages publishes and is invalid, so what is the valid one? How do you how do we fix it? Swap it, right? Okay, simply just swap it. And then like when we swap it, we need to val revalidate the triples, right? See if they are valid or not. Because like you created the triples, the reason I didn't create it. That's why we need to rerun the same algorithm that we had before. And this time, luckily, that we have uh, in this, we have like Dr. Shin is a professor consistent with what we have in our triple, in our um, knowledge base. So that is how we, we, we run the rule and find the inconsistency in the knowledge base. And this is just like a one or two rules. There are many rules like that. So let's say in the in the knowledge base, if you have like a million of triples, the reasoner it will identify the triple levels uh, rules, right? Uh, sorry, schema level rules, something like this, and it will execute the rules one by one and find all of the inconsistency in the knowledge base. I don't know the scale of this. Uh, I haven't done um, this this reasoning on the last scale. But um, according to the, um, the papers, it looks like if we have like two million, uh, two millions of uh, entities, it, it will take like an hour. And they say that because all of these are performed like, in memory. If you use like, in memory, it, it is limited, right? Like for, for if you have a larger knowledge base, it may not fit into the memory. So that that is because. Because of that reason, we can say it is a big data problem. When things doesn't fit in the memory, you need to find other solution that scale well. So back to the uh, single ontologies that we had before. So that is like uh, I collected all the triples that we created from the beginning and put them into the single ontologies. That that's how we created them. And if you look at this, uh, if you look at this ontology, you will say, like, uh, I don't know if you can distinguish the column. <laughs> Let's say this. You say, uh, Anishad is a type faculty. Actually, I highlighted it because it is an info triple. It is info from the two, uh, two triples that I highlighted as the blue one. We have like Anishad type professor and professor subclass of faculty. That is why we can infer one of the rules that we have here. So any questions on the properties part? No, that means you understand things completely or you have no idea. <laughs> or you are just sleeping, you can can talk. Or I will assume that you all get it. So the next part of this is the type separation. Actually, this is a very uh, practical problem, right? Because like, there is no single solution in the knowledge representation. Like, given a set, given, given, um, given any, let's say, um, any set of or any knowledge base, there's always more than one way to represent it. Like you may want to represent it as a property or a resource or like instance and classes, right? This is a, it is a hard problem actually. That is why we need to come up with a, every approach here. It is specific to one application. If you create a set of reports for yourself, that is specific to your application. It doesn't mean that other people have to uh, use or or. Re reuse or uh, modify your approach. 
we don't have a, we don't have a one one solution fit all. But when you uh, when you uh, when you represent your knowledge in area, it's up to you. It's <coughs> on your requirements. What kind of do you want to apply your reasoning on your data set? Or you just want to represent them in triple so that you can query and share with other people. If you if you want to apply the reasoning on your data set or the knowledge base, you have to follow certain rules in order for the reasoner to work with. One of them is the type separation. There are certain rules saying that when you need to specify that resource as one instance, or when you need to specify it as a class. In the ad, so the limit, the limit of this uh, <coughs> ad here, there are other kind of reasoning on the L ontology, but here we just talk about the ad here, right? And ad here is green. So if you are modeling the hierarchy, class hierarchy, and you are using the subclass of, the subject and the object of that must be class. If you put one of them, like as instance or something, then it won't work. The reasoner will say there's error in it, or inconsistency. Second, if you are using the sub property of to model the hierarchy, property hierarchy, and then the subject and the object of that must be property. That means there must be type as idea property. The third one is if you want to declare one instance or if you want to instantiate one instance of one specific class. And then the subject of that will be the instance or any resource, right? But the object of that must be a class. Instance of an IDFS class. So the three triples like this, they are if you have other triples that follow these three patterns, they are called schema triples, right? And the last one, if you have some other property, right, and you want to assert a relationship between them, in that case, the instances they cannot be the class. They have to be instances of resource, IDFS resource. And the, all the triples that fall into this pattern, they are called is, uh, instance triples. The, this, um, we distinguish them just for the reasoning part. Later on, the schema triples is called um, uh, T-box T -box triple. And the instance triples are called A-box. I don't know like, if anybody, maybe somebody who present the L and L reasoning. Uh, if not, then uh, you can obtain um, another class in this uh, class, knowledge representation. So in that, he will present all of the uh, foundations of analogies, including like um, our. So in this, because um, for the limitation of this class, this is uh, this is not semantic web class. So I just introduced the uh, the popular analogies. That we use in a way. A lot of us are using the like IDF, IDFS, and Sparkle, but reasoning is like um, not yet at this point. So let's say, um, assume that we, we need to follow them, right? But like we are stuck on people, we say, why do we need to follow them? If I don't follow them, what will happen? Right? The reason that we need to use them is because of the reasoner. Okay? The reasoner, it will look into all of these triple and it will find the allowable values for, for the triples or the property. So if you are intended to use um, reasoning in your application, you need to take care on this part. If you don't care about the reasoning, you are okay. Not a big deal. 
So we we say that we can use the uh, area of time for defining the distance, right? And then uh, domain and range for the subject and the object type of a property. And then we have the subclass of and sub property of for the property hierarchy and class hierarchy. So the those property themselves also have the domain and range. That means those those building property for the IDFS, they are uh, they also have the restriction on them. So this is this is the list of the restriction area of type. The area of types range IDFS class. It means if you create any triples with the area of type, you have to put that the object of that must be instance of classes. <coughs> The second property is the IDFS domain. So when we say uh, a property domain something, and then the, the subject the, the subject of that must be one property, and the object of that is a class. Must must be like that. Similarly for the IDFS range and subclass of and sub property of. Can you explain it again? So the domain, right? When we say the domain of the IDFS domain property is a property. That means only the properties, right? Only the properties are restricted to be instance of property. And the range of that is the class. Similarly for the range and the subclass of the domain and range of that will be classes. And the domain and range of the sub properties are property. These are the rule. If you go back to the previous one, the domain, if you look at this subclass of right, the domain of domain of that is a class, the range of that is also a class. So indeed the two triples that we just made in the next slide are used for the reasoning part. We will go and look for those values. Right? Similarly, for the sub-property of, like property and property, right? if you look at the second row like this, the domain and range of that are property. <coughs> and, and the rules that we specified before, it will be used for validate, validating these triples. That is why we need to we need to specify the type for the instances or the classes. That is why it is important because it is used by the reasoner. Okay. So this is the complete list. Only for the, the properties that we mentioned here. This is not a complete list for all the properties in the area base. So the, the complete the complete place of that will be in the in the um, IDF schema recommendation. And this is the, the last one. This is the um, schema hierarchy for some of the classes. The red one have for um, the red one have for uh, classes and this the blue one have for property. So that's it. Oh, we just have two minutes. Okay, so I will just um, briefly explain the, the next homework. So if we look at the next homework, I didn't give you any triples, right? So in this homework, this is an open uh, exercise where first you need to choose your topic. Any topic that you like, that you are familiar with, or you, you like to think about that. Any of them. So in that, in the first questions, choose your topic of interest and create the IDF ont IDFS ontology on top of that. So in the first questions, you need to create at least three classes and two at least two properties. right? And when you 
after you created the vases and the properties, you need to create at least two IDFS subclass of statement and one IDFS sub property of. The purpose of this is create. It just for the class, right? We created a set of classes, and then we form the class hierarchy, and then we create a set of properties, and we form the class the property hierarchy. So this is for the first step, uh, the first questions. For the second questions, we extend the, the ontologies in the first questions and add uh, at least two instances for each of your class. Right, so that means at least six instances in total. And and just for the just to refresh what we had in the previous class, um, you make sure that you include at least one part of them, like replication, container, collection, or literal part of them. Pick one of them, right? And in the last questions, um, that on the reasoning part, that we extend the, the ontology from the question 2 and specify all the domain and range of your properties. Right? And then you can you can apply the rules that we had before just to infer at least two new triples. So basically you cre recreate the simple ontologies that I, I had in earlier slide with your topic and make sure that like um, uh, it is not necessary that other people agree with you it is just you create it and you believe that it makes sense right? it's open there's no right or wrong so any questions? For, for this, it may take time for me to look at your um, solution. So the deal of this is um, midnight of uh, Sunday. Or do you want to explain it? No? Sunday is fine? Yeah, I know that. So that's it. Thank you.